Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now, I talk about ASA every week and every week I encourage you to do a couple of things. The first is go to their Facebook page. ASA has a wonderful Facebook page and you can find out everything that's going on in the world of animal studies, both in Australia and also internationally. The other thing you can do is check out their website. They've got a really fantastic website, including lots of art by our ASA members who are also artists. And finally, think about joining ASA. ASA relies on membership subs to run its activities. So if you get some benefit out of ASA, I suggest you think about giving back by becoming a member. That's ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Well, we're here in lovely Annandale town once again. The sun is shining. It's a beautiful day. It's starting to get a little bit cold. But I'm really, really pleased to be able to bring you a very special guest this week. This week I'm joined by David Brooks. Do you, do you still go by Associate Professor or... Oh, yeah, no, oh, that's no, gone no. by the by. No. <laughs> Liberated from that title. Just David. David is a poet and novelist. Now, um, today we're going to discuss David's brand new book, which is called The Grass Library, and it's published by Brandall and Schlesinger, and it is coming out in August 2019. Uh, We're going to hear all about the book, but um, as someone who's read it, I can assure you that it's really wonderful. So, part of um, one of the things we're going to discuss today is how you can order a copy. But for now, welcome to the podcast, David. Thank you. I'm very, very glad to have the invitation. So, why this book? What inspired it? Uh, the, the, the book wrote itself in a way. Uh, it, uh, I was on the telephone, uh, I think about 12 years ago, 10 years ago, with a friend in Western Australia, and uh, the, the, the poet and uh, animal activist, and vegan activist, John Kinsella. I don't name him in the book, because, uh, but uh, we were on the phone and we were talking about uh, the way animals had generally been ignored in the discussion of Australian literature. And, uh, and we suddenly decided on the phone that we were going to do a book of essays uh, on works of Australian literature from an animalist, as it were, perspective. Uh, And uh, John and I was, at the time, I was looking at my dog, who was uh, sort of sitting at my feet, looking up at me, you know, listening to the conversation, I guess, because it was talking about animals, like maybe he was interested. And um, and, uh, John said, um, so what would you really like to write about? You know, what kind of essays would you like to write? And I mentioned a few Australian texts and things like that and then started to broaden out for some reason because suddenly it seemed like a fairly narrow project to be talking about Australian literature yet again. I've been talking about it for 30 years. so um, And so I, I said, uh, yeah, and the animal in philosophy and and the animal in language. You know, obviously I was going crazy with my um, ambition. And then I... And I'm looking at Charlie the dog, and uh, and then I I said, and I'd like to write about my dog. <laughs> he said, What do you mean, write about your dog? And I said, Well, a kind of biography of my dog. And he, John, got very excited at this idea. So for the next two or three years, I was writing essays on works of Australian literature from an animal perspective. And we'll, we might talk about those later. And and uh, and at the same time, taking notes about Charlie the dog. And I I I found myself suddenly it changed things because I was 
paying attention and I was trying to explain to an empty page what I'd been seeing. And I was already being pulled into something, right? And uh, to, to cut a long story short, we found ourselves, when I, when I left the university, we uh, moved on to a, a little farm, X farm. And, um, and one of the first things I did uh, when I had a writing space organised was to sit down and start trying to write about Charlie because suddenly I had the space to do it and the frame of mind to do it and so forth um, and so I, I wrote six or eight or ten thousand words about Charlie and uh, and and by the time I looked up and you know caught my breath about three weeks later we had two rescue sheep with us because someone had heard that we had a farm um, with no animals and so we had taken on rescue sheep. And um, it was hard to keep the sheep out of my thinking. Um, and, and, and the sheep invited other animals in. And I found that the book was suddenly becoming a book about sheltering animals uh, in the Blue Mountains, not, not a biography of Charlie. And it was never intended to be a book in the first place. Of course, it was supposed to be one essay. Um, but now, obviously, it was going to be something bigger. And I kept writing about the experiences with the animals for about three years, uh, and slowly the book sort of shaped itself. But in the book, I characterised Charlie, the dog, as a kind of psychopomp, you know, somebody who had some being who had led me into a place that had been dark to me before, you know, opened the headspace, um, you know, showed me what an idiot I was uh, and started to teach me, as it were. And that's sort of the way the book had its genesis more generally because, you know, if Charlie wasn't teaching me, as it were, then the sheep were and so forth. I mean, I have a friend in the mountains, uh, a, a poet friend who... Um, uh, who refers to the sheep as my co-authors. And he comes to visit me quite regularly, but I think he comes actually to visit the sheep. Um, and I th I think he, like so many others, just loves the idea that they they come in and out of my writing space at will because in a way that's simply a, a physical representation of what they have already been doing um, intellectually or psychologically. Wow. You know, there's so much I want to ask you about. Uh, it, the book is beautifully written and perhaps that's not surprising to hear me say that given that you are a writer and this is what you, you've done for a long time. Charlie f features but so do a lot of other animals, as you say. I'm just wondering, do you know more about Charlie now? Were you ever able to look at the world through Char from Charlie's perspective or know a little bit more about it? I am, in some ways, uh, I know a lot more about what I don't know, which I think is part of the process. I mean, I think one of the first things humans try to do when they find themselves in a new situation or with a new phenomenon is try to know it but in fact uh, I think we we actually need to sort of think about what knowing is um, so that it doesn't become a kind of damaging thing you know one of the things that happens when you know an animal if you're not careful is you, you're sort of castrating it you know um, I think that there's so so the whole question of knowing is a fascinating one in the first place. I am much more sensitive to Charlie, yes, I think. And I I, I think that um, I, my love for Charlie has become a, a much more um, open thing, you know, and, and um, a much more, it's, 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 uh, I mean, I, I, I hear all the time that people love their 
pets and so forth. And I, I would always have said that myself, but this is just different, you know. Um, I, I, I sort of suffer with him. Um, I, he's getting old now, and he's, um, he's had, I think, a, a, a minor stroke, maybe a series of, of small strokes. Um, I, I've learnt to read his body and to think more about his situation than I was ever capable of doing before. If that's knowing him more, then then that's knowing him more. Mm. Um, I, I and I'd say much the same thing about the sheep. You know, I I I'm I'm not so confident about saying anything emphatic, firm about their personalities or whatever. They very, very distinctively have personalities. There's no question about that. But but to use my comfortable human terms to describe moods and changes within them and aspects of their personality is something I'm a little bit, I'm still, I'm, in fact, maybe I'd say I'm increasingly uncomfortable doing because um, I'm not sure that the language is ready for a lot of a lot of what I encounter. So I'm actually sort of pushing myself further into a kind of silence, um, which is a, a fascinating process and a fascinating space. And it has to be, ironically, it has to be articulated. You know, it's because I think it's important to sort of spread my reflections about that kind of space because I think what's happened to me in the mountains with Charlie and with the sheep and with the rats <laughs> and the and the birds and so forth is um, I've been given this extraordinary privilege. It's just happened an extraordinary privilege. Mm. That is that I can be with them and watch them um, most of every day, you know, uh, and and not many people get that, and uh, I I think it's not a privilege that you can just sort of enjoy and then swallow and die with. I think that the the that it has to be uh, it has to be made available, you know, and I have to force myself to articulate things that are difficult to articulate. Um. Yeah, look, the, to my mind, there are a few, in addition to obviously the, the non-human animals, there are a few themes that run through the book. And one of them is very much about, I think, confinement and freedom. Mm. And another, I think, is about change. So just thinking about the confinement and freedom situation, I mean, one of the things you think about is what it means to Charlie to be living in the country versus the city and how what that means. And I think also, of course, you're going through very big changes as well. Can mm. you say something about the theme of, of kind of those things, the, the freedom and the well, change? <laughs> well, one of, I think what, what one of the things that the book is, has has turned out to be about is ethics yeah. and problems of thought um, and one of the things that I do find myself doing I, I have found myself doing through the book is being as honest as I can about the ethical challenges that l offering shelter to animals represent you know. Um, I'll give you one example that isn't in the book, right? Because Please. this is this is more recent, a more recent ob observation. Um, I mean, the book finishes officially three years ago, uh, but the thinking has just gone on, of course. And the and the sheep have gotten older, and Charlie's gotten older, and 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 uh, and the questions have changed. Um, s in some ways, they've matured, and so forth. Um, and one of the things that I was thinking recently, I mean, this is just last week, uh, Taya said to me, 
uh, at one point, because do you, do you, do you, she worries about this all the time. Um, do you think the sheep are happy? You know, because there are some days when they just don't seem very happy. You know, well, some days Taya doesn't seem very happy. Some days I don't seem very happy. <laughs> it's not necessarily. I know the feeling too. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But but you know, she, we want them to be as happy as possible. But of course, one of the things that happens when you offer refuge is you offer a quiet space for them to mature, but also for the grief in them to mature um, and to emerge. And uh, and I think that hoping for happiness is something that maybe um, maybe we 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 overemphasize. You know that that um, in refuge. What you're going to encounter um, when you give refuge is you're going to encounter a huge amount of sadness. You're going to encounter a huge... I think one of the things I've learned about sheep, for example, is they carry an immense burden of grief. And and that's something that takes a long time before they were, are prepared to share it with you, you know. Um, uh, they do share it. I mean, we don't talk about it, as it were. Uh, I mumble about it to them, and they look at me as if, you know, I'm 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 just making a human sound. You know, uh, humans make these sounds. Uh, God knows what they mean, but you, <laughs> um, but 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 they physically um, they they, they um, been begin to respond to things that they have taken a long, long time, almost sort of innately resisting. Um, I, I, I had a feeling or maybe a month, month and a half ago that uh, suddenly the oldest sheep um, had learned to trust me in a way that he'd never quite been happy to do before. We'd always gotten along, but, but, but there was just one day when he came and he, it was almost as if he came and... He just wanted to have a cry, and mm. um, uh, you know, sheep don't cry in the way that we recognise. Mm. But I felt it. Mm. I mean, I, I felt this. He was putting into my hands this, this uh, soft, but very heavy thing, um, and it had to be grief. That's the only way I could explain it, mm. and 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 that took years to emerge mm, mm. Uh, and and so I, I, I you would think that um, that it's it's not something that gets seen very often mm, um, mm. Mm, fascinating yeah it's I, I you know I spent quite a little, lot of time thinking about what's going on what what kind of life I'm providing to Gracie the cat and what, what she's thinking about it's almost an intractable kind of pursuit, I guess. But I guess one of the things you're pointing to is what we do with that knowledge or make of that knowledge or how carefully or thoughtfully we treat that knowledge. I, I think that one of the problems we do have when we, when we approach uh, a non-human animal you know, is impatience. And I think we, we can put aside that need to know, we can put aside, uh, aside that constant assessment of our own progress, as it were, and and just be and um, and let, let that space begin to teach you, you know. Um, so it's, it's perfectly possible to have similar experiences with Gracie the cat, of course. Um, it's it's really a matter of letting go of the 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 old and in some ways the bad old ways of of knowing and communicating. Mm. You know, I mean, I I I find it I extraordinary to me. I know m many really dedicated animal people whose love for their dogs, for example, is just it's just extraordinary. You know, it's 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 deep and it's enduring and so forth, but uh, but but these people uh, are unable to let the dog lick their face or 
you know, there are certain things, there's still barriers, you know. Mm. And I, I think that there's a difference between, between hard hands and soft hands. And I think to be, it, be able to get to the point where, you, where you've got soft hands, where you lie down with the dog, where you'll hug the dog, you know, where you'll let the dog's anus sit on your jeans and things like that. <laughs> um, are, 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 there's a sea change mm. or a D change mm. if, if we're talking about dogs. Mm. Um, and, and, um, and that's a profound change. Mm. So these thoughts you're having about animals and everything you're trying to convey in the book and on the page... Would they have been possible just through your relationship with Charlie or is there something about letting other species of animals or other types of animals that perhaps we don't have as much access to into your lives that has helped facilitate this thinking? I think, I think that that's an excellent question and, <laughs> and uh, I think it's – I think, no, they wouldn't have been possible. I mean, a lot might have been possible with Charlie, you know, and, and – um, uh, and yet, the thing that one worries about with companion animals who have been, you know, h- human companion animals for for many many millennia, is that we have evolved toward each other uh, in ways that um, might make us a little bit. Um, too demanding on other animals in terms of uh, conveying what we understand as sentience or whatever, you know. Uh, and I think that um, the huge difference between, say, Charlie and and the sheep is that the sheep come from a, uh, a very very long history of um, of instrumentalization and and massive abuse and um, and Charlie's been on a slightly different track but uh, that's not to say that Charlie isn't also a victim of I- instrumentalization and serious abuse I mean I think every animal that we could possibly imagine um, is is living in a a humanized world and is a, vi- a victim of human abuse. I mean, there's, it's just that's just definitive. But uh, but I think you need a variety of animals in a way to to peel you open, um, and and that's certainly the way it's been with the sheep, for example. Mm. Um, and I, I I'm I'm surprised that. Um, I was so intrigued um, by the behaviour of rats <laughs> around the farm too, because old farms have rats, you know, God and um, yeah. you're part of a, a rat path, you, just as you are part of a snake path and a, and 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 flight paths for the birds and so forth, and um, and any human construction interrupts these paths, but the paths, in a way, still exist, so you you have to. You have to uh, start to map um, those paths wh- wherever you live mm. in order to know where you are in the first place. Mm. So uh, my sense is that this book's going to attract a, a wide readership. I certainly hope so. Um, it's going to be uh, hopefully soft cover. It'll be soft cover, won't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it'll be yeah. affordable. Of course, as I always say to listeners, if you can't afford to buy it yourself, think about ordering it for your institution or, or, or um, local library or both. But a lot of the listeners of Knowing Animals are people who are already very interested in animal issues. Yes, yeah. What are you hoping readers will get out of the book? I'm hoping that the book can introduce people who are not so dedicated at this p- point um, to uh, 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 it, it, it can further their thinking about animals so uh, it's not an academic book I, I, I tr- I, I've spent so much of my life writing academic papers and so forth that um, 
I, I realise that in order to introduce a wider public to these issues, you can't afford to write, be writing academic discourse, which, which holds them back and, and, and doesn't invite them in in the first place. I mean, each kind of discourse has its, 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 its place and its function, major function. Um, but I do feel that all of my writing life now seems to me to have been preparation to write these books that, for me, are suddenly a part of a mission and um, they, they, they do seem to um, explain why I've taken so long to get here. And, um, and so, yes, I'm hoping that I've packaged it in a way that will make it more accessible to people who, um, who, who maybe wouldn't be fellow travellers um, in terms of their orientation to animals at this particular point, but might come in because they've read other things that I've written, mm. um, because they um, that they they are approaching it because it's supposedly a good book, mm. as it were. Um, almost regardless of its subject. Mm. And these things do happen. I mean, it... Mm. Um, yeah, but look, I also think that there is a huge amount in here for people who are very steeped in, in animal studies scholarship. Uh, I mean, as you point out, the ethical issues that you're grappling with, but just the, even the honest account of how it all came to pass and what was gained and what was sacrificed mm. and how you work through the complexities in your mind, I think mm. it will be interesting and resonate with a lot of people who as I say are very engaged at the minute as well you know, I absolutely hope so yeah. because uh, as I say over and over again in the book probably one time too many um, animals do need non-human animals need all the help that they can get mm. and, um, mm. and it seems to me that with my other disabilities and so forth um this is the best way that I can ha try to help. Mm, so. Absolutely. Well, David, ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? Uh, sure. Are you ready for my five long answers? <laughs> <laughs> can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Uh, it probably was Rachel Carson's Silent, Silent Spring, and that was what? 1968 or something like that, mm. um, which is to age myself a bit. But uh, but in the new incarnation of animal studies, um, I I think I would I th I think uh, it's it's I may have read a few essays and so forth um, around it, but the the major work, the standout work for me is is Charles Patterson's Eternal Treblinka. Oh, and, wonderful. Um, and and um, so much so that I, I insisted that my friends in Slovenia translate it and publish it <laughs> <laughs> straight away. So they, they, they've published an edition of it there. But um, that book was profound um, to me. You know, I just... I, I, I have... I think I was already thinking that that the Holocaust was was just continuing, had never stopped, but its its principal subject was animals. But I I didn't realize how deeply historically those two Holocausts were were linked, and and the Shoah and and what happens daily to animals um, and how they came from the same models of of mass production and so forth so I just um, it floored me that book and 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 um, uh, in order to answer this question for you today I picked it up again and I'm halfway through it yet again right. so, <laughs> so it's, it's um, wonderful yeah. so can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote I wrote an essay very soon after uh, after 
becoming a vegan in my emphatic vegan days um, when I thought being angry was helpful, but it, it's not. Um, I wrote an essay called uh, The Smoking Vegetarian. I couldn't call it The Smoking Vegan because that would have meant that no one would publish the essay, I think. But, right. <laughs> but it was published in a... Uh, it was basically about becoming vegan and and I called it The Smoking Vegetarian because uh, I wanted people to know that you, there were other reasons than than your health to to become a, a vegan. Mm. But in that essay, I didn't even talk about veganism per se. I mean, I was talking about veganism the whole time, but I called it vegetarianism because it was a time when um, vegans were still a kind of in the closet. Stock. Mm. Um, uh, Anthony Bourdain, you know, calling vegans the Hezbollah of of, of <laughs> cuisine or whatever and mm. things like that. Yeah, yeah, we've moved on, haven't we? Extraordinarily. Yeah. I mean, we uh, at that particular time, we thought it, the day would never come when we would... We could be accepted in the community. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and now people are saying... Um, <laughs> we've got <laughs> our own magnum yeah. now. Is there a non-vegan <laughs> restaurant around here somewhere? <laughs> In different parts of the city. Well, not oh. quite, but, we, but it is quite extraordinary how it's taken. But I did write, I, I, so I don't really consider that my first animal essay. I, I mentioned it just because it was the first essay in that sort of area. But the first one that I taught Australian literature for a long, long time. And so I, I, m the first time I actually seriously wrote a, an animal studies kind of essay was... Um, uh, it was inspired by the uh, Not the Melbourne Cup events that we were organising. Um, and this was probably 19, uh, 2008 or 2009. And I wrote an essay on uh, one of the stock standard great Australian poems, The Man from Snowy River, and, but from the horse's point of view. Oh, and, wow. and it was called Cracks in the Fray, which is just... a, a a quotation from the poem, but these were cracks in uh, our thinking about animals, and and um, and and I l literally went through the poem stanza by stanza, showing that it was actually a poem about animal abuse, or rather, that it was a poem full of animal abuse, wow. not ne not necessarily um, about it, but. Um, I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, Wonderful. Um, oh, I have to look that one up. So, if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? I I listened to a few of your other podcasts, and I realised that I wouldn't be the only person who uh, um, refused to keep <laughs> it to to one. Um, well, there are two. It's a fine there, tradition. There are two, and it's very. Uh, one is Jacques Derrida, the philosopher, um, but that's not uh, because he influenced me very strongly. I, it's, it's not a matter of agreement is what I mean. It, um, I, I found myself, because I had been, a, a, uh, I'd, I'd studied Derrida as a teacher of literature um, for so long, I naturally followed Derrida when he made his animal turn. And so when um, the animal that therefore I am appeared, I, I was probably one of its first Australian readers. Um, but I was really disappointed by the book. I was really disappointed by him. And I ended up writing a book against that book, as it were, pointing out the inconsistencies and the hypocrisies and so forth of, of Derrida's position. Uh, and so he was profoundly influential, but not necessarily um, because I was agreeing with him. But the other one is 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 my partner, uh, Taya Privats, and th and and that is because she's just completed a a doctorate that she did part time, took seven years, and for seven years we've been talking about animal sentience and talking about neuroscience and talking about um, 
attachment theory and all sorts of other things that she's combined in what is, um, to my thinking, and I think to the thinking of some other people, quite an extraordinary thesis. But her reading has been eye-opening to me in every respect and and the work that she's been doing. So um, I, I thought hard about answering that and I thought any other answer would be dishonest. So mm -hmm. yeah. I have to get Taylor on the show, <laughs> note to self. <laughs> What's the most important thing academics can do for animals? I think we do... The most obvious thing is stop eating them, you know. But then let's just think about academics within their, I in situ, you know, within their profession. Um, I think the most important thing that they can do is to think about their own discipline from an animal perspective so that, um, you know, if they're in th their training is in law and they're teaching law, to think about the law from an animal perspective or to think about history from an animal perspective or to think about psychology from an animal perspective. And at first it seems a little bit clunky and mechanical, but once you start identifying the, 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 the rocks in the road and the difficult patches and you start really questioning those, you start opening the field. Just as I, I, I realised suddenly, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, I should be doing with Australian literature, and you know, re-examining the man from Snowy River from, a, from the horse's perspective. Um, this has to be done in every academic field, even, even mathematics. I'm convinced somewhere in <laughs> mathematics there's still a dependency and an, an instrumentalisation of the animal. Mm. Interesting. We'll have to get Jason Grossman on onto that one. I think you definitely need Jason Grossman. <laughs> Had the power to change one thing about the human non human animal relationship, what would it be? Well, I, I've I've got two answers. In uh, one of them, in the very broad sense, and uh, a little bit utopian, is w we would stop instrumentalizing. Uh, instrumentalizing animals, um, we would stop um, abusing animals, we would stop eating animals. Um, but given that abuse and uh, instrumentalization of animals and animal ingredients are in practically every aspect of our lives, um, that that might be a bit utopian. We could at least become more conscious of the fact that they are sustaining us in every part of our being um, and and abuse of animals is sustaining us so that not none of us is uh, is 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 not guilty but the other answer is 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 much more um, local um, we've managed to reduce the free animals of the world, um, the free-ranging animals of the world, uh, to 15% of the, of the biomass, you know, of, of the animal biomass. Um, we have a, a terrible record here in Australia and we have deeply fixed into our relationship with animals and our understanding of conservation the idea of culling the idea of killing, uh, and 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 so that so that conservation, w we actually have a term, um, conservation killing, here in Australia, and it's employed by every um, relevant government instrumentality and so forth. It's understood that in order to conserve, we have to kill. If I could change any one thing, it would be that attitude, and. I, I, I would I would do anything I could to get rid of this idea that in order to conserve we have to kill. Mm. Mm. Fascinating. It seems to me that we, we we're the country that put in the Snowy Mountains scheme. You know, turned rivers backwards and so forth. We did 
amazing things when we needed to do them and when they suited us. Um, so uh, why haven't we been able to come up with some other solution in terms of conservation than, than massacre? Mm. Mm, yes. Actually, I was speaking to Helen Tiffin about the situation at Lord Howe Island. You won't be pleased with that one, David. No, I won't be. Um, I've got immense um, respect for Helen and, um, and we have occasionally corresponded about Lord Howe Island, but um, no, I'm, I, mm. I, I don't think I even want to go there. Yeah. I'm still mm. recovering from the news of two days ago that after all the fighting against the ACT kangaroo cull, annual cull, this year's cull is is going to be double the figure of last year and the highest cull ever in, mm. in terms of their annual massacre. So. Well, David, on that note, what are you working on next? <laughs> um, the Grass Library is just one volume of a of what I think is going to be a kind of sestet, maybe a septet. Um, it's the second one, and the third and fourth and fifth are already underway. So oh, great. Um, uh, the next book out after this will probably be a book of essays from the Sydney University Press, um, a, a, a fairly chunky collection of about 16 or so animal related essays and um, I think that that's what I'm going to be spending the next 12 months doing just editing that and getting it polished enough to to be published. Wonderful so how can people find out more about your work? I have a website it's a bit dilapidated because I, I, I can never find the time to doctor it properly but um, uh, it's uh, David Brooks as one word, davidbrooks.net.au, mm. um, though to access it you have to have the HTTPS mm. colon double forward slash before it or it won't work. Mm. But you're also w one of the kind of great Australian writers, so I'm sure Google will help people out if they, if they want to find out more about you and your... Um, well, that's a very sweet thing for you to say. Um, and uh, yes, there is. Um, I think that the, the, the website address in forwards is at the wiki entry on my work. Yeah. But don't confuse me with the New York Times journalist named David Brooks. Okay. Who's, um, <laughs> who's ra radically right. And, um, <laughs> and I don't, don't, I don't yeah. very much agree with him. Yeah, so if there's a lot of... Trump praise and no mention of animals, it's not you. It's not me. It's not me. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, a podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Now, you can follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals. You can also like us on Facebook at Knowing Animals. And most importantly, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes because reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like Knowing Animals.